Eminem just reached a major eight milestone. Every angsty teenager's favorite film, Eight Mile, which features Eminem in his film acting debut, turned 20 years old on Sunday. The movie contains many autobiographical elements from Eminem's life, which follow the story of a white rapper who's trying to break into the rap scene in Detroit, Michigan, which is Eminem's hometown. Alongside Eminem, the movie also featured actors Mekki Pfeiffer, Michael Shannon, Anthony Mackie, Kim Basinger, and the late Brittany Murphy, who appeared in the movie at the height of her career. The film was critically acclaimed during its release and was nominated for and won many prestigious awards in 2002, including an Academy Award for Best Original Song for Lose Yourself. Access Hollywood spoke to Eminem ahead of the movie's release, and to mark 20 years since the premiere of 8 Mile, we're taking a look back at that conversation. Nice to see you again. Same here. This is the very stage that Hootie and the Blowfish have performed on. <laughs> here we sit. Who? <laughs> you did some rehearsals in here, right? Yeah, we uh, actually we rehearsed for the tour. Yeah. Here a few times. We had like a week blocked out. Did you ever want to do a movie? Let's start with that. I mean, did you ever say to yourself, someday I want to be in a movie as part of your scheme? Or maybe I should say, did you ever have a scheme? Um, my only scheme really was to be a rapper. Mm -hmm. Like, I just wanted to, my dream was like, give me, let me get a record deal and let me go gold and I'll be happy. Let me make a living off of what I do. Um, as things went along and, you know, uh, my life got more interesting uh, as it went along and to other people, um, the subject was brought up a few times and it was like, you know, the idea was toyed with and then it was, um, then it just began to I don't know what's the word I'm looking for. Just evolved, just evolved, and just kind of rolled. But yeah, and just it started getting bigger and bigger. Uh, you know, more serious. I started taking it more serious. Uh, we got a good script. Scott Silver wrote a good script. I read it. It's one of the few things I've ever read because I don't like to read. But once I started reading the script, I really got into it and was like, I did want to. At that stage of my life, want to make a movie that was real and true to what I'm about, but also what anybody else who's trying to come up as a rapper um, or just through music, period, could relate to. But um, I just wanted to do one movie, just but just true and authentic, and just to capture like I felt like where I grew up. And how I grew up, my, my story and the things that I saw was so interesting. I feel like 8 Mile is, is not just the movie, I'm talking about 8 Mile Road, period. Just and what it means symbolically and everything to me, like, is a story that I wanted to just get across to the world. Because I know there's in every city, every state has, you know, what separates the city from the suburbs, you know, uh, majority. Uh, statistically what separates black from white and you know usually it's literally just one road and there's eight mile is there's one median in the middle of the road that separates the city from suburbs mm -hmm. and 95 especially um, right now it's a little more diverse I think um, as far as like ethnic wise it's a little more, you know you see it's more racially mixed now. Because mm -hmm. back then, it was Biggie was still around and Tupac, right? I mean, it was... Yeah, when, when that shit started heating up, I mean, but even, even before that, it, it, not even anything to do with hip hop, just um, how segregated, you know, the city was from the suburbs, like literally being across the street from each other, but how segregated it was, it's come a long way from since 95 to now, you know, in these seven years, it's become a lot more. You, you wouldn't see too many 
black people on the on the white side and too many white people on the black side. It's know, amazing only miles. seven years ago. Yeah. But it's it's definitely got you can see it it's it's you know, people I think as time goes by, the world is getting more, you know, a little more open minded and starting to just take life for what it is and take shit for what it really is. And I mean that's 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 my take on it. But me coming up and and through that time, like the early late eighties, early nineties, um, racial tension was pretty high. What was it like being a white rapper back then? Did, did, did people say, white rapper? Is this possible? <laughs> well, there was a lot of... There or were be, there more of them? There was a lot of cats that I seen, like, as I was coming up, you know, that were trying to come up around the same time as me, who um, never made it or haven't made it yet, you know, but uh, very few uh, I would see in the same spots that I was in. Mm -hmm. You know, where I would go would be clubs where I would literally, you know, I would, I, I used to literally make my own tapes, go to Kinko's, press up, draw my own covers, press the covers up at Kinko's and, and sell them out of my trunk, go into these clubs where I'm literally like the only white person there, sell and trying to sell my tape just or, or, or my CD that I would save up like my income tax checks from my job at the <laughs> end of the year and put it all into into my music save it and go to these clubs and just try to sell it for four dollars get this CD a lot of times even giving it out just like listen to this you know every time there was a hip-hop summit if it was in Detroit if it was in Miami if it was in Cincinnati you know get in the car with my friends, some of them from, from D12, get in the car, just drive down there and just try to get anybody to just listen to our demo. Yeah. How did people respond to you when, you when they saw you standing there? You know, here, listen to this. Well, what, what hi, we used I'm to white. do... Uh, <laughs> right, hi, <laughs> hi, I'm white. <laughs> listen to my CD. Um, what we used to do, um, me and... Uh, and, and Proof, Proof used to have his own uh, methods of doing things. You know, Proof uh, was, used to be like Mr. Polly, man. Like he was cool with, like he was down with like a lot of rappers that, you know, uh, that were kind of big in the underground. So when, when, when we would make trips to Miami and stuff like that, he would go hang with them and Polly with them. And he had his own way, like his own agenda of meeting people. We would kind of we would kind of split up a little bit, and then me and Bazaar literally had a radio and was walking around with it, just playing our demo, <laughs> just like as loud as we could, and trying to figure out what hotel Fat Joe was at or what hotel, uh, you know, any rapper was that that would just maybe walk by we'd catch him walking out the hotel and like just be sitting there and and somebody would walk by and just that glimmer of hope like catch somebody's ear and be like, yo, what is that that you're playing? So I could be like, yo, it's my, it's my demo. This is, this is my, you know, uh, the, 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 what, what was it, the 96 or 97 Freaknik I went to with uh, Bazaar also and a couple other friends and uh, was literally doing the same thing, just handing my tape, like standing on the corner, like handing my tapes out. We'd drive in a car, we'd roll the window down, we'd see some people who looked like they would listen to hip hop, and just anybody who <laughs> looked like they would even l remotely have their ear open to hip hop, just, <laughs> yo, here, take this, it's free, just yeah. take it, listen to it. So who listened you know? to it? How'd you get, what was your one moment? <sighs> My one moment? Um, what got you here? What got me here? Mm -hmm. Dr. Dre, obviously. Um, him hearing the tape. It wasn't well, there a story. Somebody heard it on the radio and got it to Jimmy and he got it. to. Dre. There was a lot of stories, but like, honestly, like I, you know, I busted my ass in the underground. Like, like I would do shows in New York. Like my manager, Paul, lived in New York, which was a which was definitely a plus where he could get me, you know, he would get me little gigs like what he could just through just from the buzz with the Slim Shady EP, like the six song mm -hmm. EP that I that we had pressed up. Um, he would give it to, you know, he had little connects with uh, 
some underground rappers, it would, he would pass it along to them and they would pass it along to their boys and then, yo, you gotta check out my man. And then it started developing into things where he would be able to get me little gigs, like, you know, where I got to open up for the boot camp click once. And um, Buckshot, w w was, it, was it what label? Duck Down. Duck Down Records had seen me. What happened one time, I'll tell you a funny story. It was the first time I had ever did a show where I opened up for anybody that was like, you know, the boot camp clique had a pretty big name in the underground. And uh, I was the first one to go on. And I had my DJ up there, uh, Lynn Swan at the time. And I had a dat that I was trying to run off of that my show was set up off of. Mm -hmm. I had like three songs I was supposed to perform and somebody wasn't playing my dad, so I got, I, got, I got on stage and the dad wasn't playing, and I was like, yo, play the dad. I got the mic, I'm like, yo, play the dad. And nobody was playing it, and people started booing and this and that, so I had my DJ throw a record on and just started freestyling over it, like, fuck it, and then won the crowd over. Then my dad started in the middle of it, and then they got to hear like my songs and then this and that. Then I got a meeting with Duck Down Records and we started talking about deals, and. And then it's, you know, little uh, independent labels started coming at me. And, and, you know, just from those things, elevating the Rap Olympics and all those things, like just generating the buzz, the Scribble Jam. You know, there's tapes of me battling. I know there's like a lot of tapes of me uh, in freestyle battles and stuff. And uh, How close were those battles in the movie to the battles that you were in? Exact same. Really? Intensity. Intensity. Like... That's one thing that I want this movie to get across is that, that people who live in this world, uh, that live in this world, this, it, it, I'm referring to hip hop, mm -hmm. like um, how seriously we take this, how seriously we take our music and, and, and battling and the sport of it and the competition and everything. Like if, for, for, for me to lose a battle when I lost, I beat out, I, we, I, at the Rap Olympics in 97, I beat out everybody. Like I went through many people and got to the end and choked a little bit. And the guy who beat me, I don't know where he is now, but you know, the, the, uh, the prize if you, if you won the battle was $500 in a, in a Rolex. And the night before I flew to LA, I had just got kicked out of my house, got evicted from, from my house and all, all our stuff had got thrown on the lawn and people was rummaging through it. And I, I'll never forget this. I was staying in the house with no heat. All the electric was cut off and everything. And I had to climb in through the back window, sleep on the floor, and then have my cell phone with me so Paul could give me a wake up call in the morning because I didn't even have, a, have an alarm clock so I could catch my plane to go to the Rap Olympics. So when I lost the battle, I needed that $500 so much. I don't know if it was a real Rolex or it was a fake Rolex. I didn't care about the Rolex, but I needed that $500. And when I lost, like, I felt like my whole manhood was just completely stripped of me. You know, I was so mad, literally, like, in such a rage. I, like, I wanted to, I, like, so emotional. I, I almost felt like crying. On what level, though? And because you needed the money or because you were so passionate about the music? So or passionate both? about just winning, period, because then your name generates. Plus, it was the second time to get it, this guy named Juice, who I lost. I beat out everybody in, in, in Cincinnati. And there was a guy named Juice from Chicago. This was like a few months before that, that uh, if I would have, in the Rap Olympics, had I won, I would have got to battle Juice, and I was waiting to do that to get a rematch because I lost to him at, at the Scribble Jam in Chicago or in Cincinnati. It was the same story. I went through everybody, went through all these cats. I beat them, kept beating everybody, got to him, and we tied in our first two battles, and then they was like, okay, we got, these are going to be the runners-up, and then the runners-up. Uh, the, the battle, the last battle, the semifinals would take place in a club. Like later on that night, the people actually had to pay at the door mm -hmm. to come and see the battle. And it was like the championship mm -hmm. thing. So it was me and Juice in the championship thing. And then the first, the first time we battled, we tied again. Mm -hmm. 
And then the second time we battled, he got me. So I wanted another chance to get at him because the winner got the $500 and the Rolex or whatever and got the battle juice again. And I wanted <laughs> to do that just to redeem myself because I felt like here in Detroit, I had never lost a battle. Like the hip hop shop, wherever I went, Ebony Showcase, any place I ever went and battled, I had never lost a battle. So Cincinnati was the first time that I ever lost a battle and it, there was no prize in Cincinnati, it was just pride. She wanted it here. Yeah, and in, in the Rap Olympics, which took place in Los Angeles, I, I wanted it so bad, I wanted so bad to redeem myself and get a second chance to get a crack at this guy because I had my ammo stacked up and I was ready to go. And then I, lose, I lost to this guy that was like, he wasn't good. And I, I don't know, it just feels like, you get so passionate when you talk about it, I can feel the intensity of it. It's like it, a Super Bowl for, for rappers. It's right? like a sport. It's like hip hop. I mean, it's like, it's like football. It's like basketball. It's like any sport. You know, it's, uh, of course, you, 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 in sports, you may, you know, you see these football players and, and basketball players that get paid a lot of money to do it, to do the sport, but that's not just why they're doing it. They're doing it for the competition of it. They want to win. You see, you see people lose the championship, you know, in and, and, and basketball, and, and you see players, like, walking away crying. Like, that's how yeah. much, that's in this world in hip-hop, that's how serious battling was, especially back in 95. And what was so, what, what used to be so dope about it was, what I kind of miss about it a little bit, but um, I understand, you know, it's gotten to a different, a little bit different level today. But what was cool about it was you could rip somebody from head to toe, like literally say whatever you wanted, and they say whatever they want back to you. And um, if you lost, you lost, and you shake hands, and that's it. It's, it's like, you it know, hard. it's like boxing. Yeah. It's like boxing in the ring. Boxers, they want to kill each other. They want to throw that knockout blow and plaster somebody's nose all over their face. And then when they're done, they walk up, they shake hands, they hug, you know, right. it's, it's and that's, art. This, it's like a this, pain. Yeah, yeah, that's the sport of hip hop, and especially in 95, that's how it was. That's how it was here in Detroit. That's how, that's just that time period, that's how it was. How close, people are gonna say, well, this is your movie, obviously, and this is about you. How close to your real life do you want people to think it is, or how close is it? Um, um, is it this close? This it's close? symbolic. Yeah. It's, it's just symbolic, I mean. Basically, you know, like obviously everything that happened in the movie didn't happen in my real life, you know, and I didn't, I've lived in trailers, but I didn't grow up in a trailer and I didn't, you know, so there's different things, but the basis of it, yeah, you know, the same idea, lower class, poor, poor kid coming up, wanting to do music, getting tugged every different which way by his friends and not knowing which way to go, make it, do, do you make a demo and do you shop it or do you, do you battle to win credibility and then get a street buzz going? Like, what do you do, you know? Like, it's the same. 